Thank you very much. I was recently talking to a friend, actually a fellow entrepreneur. Uh, he's based in Asia, but he has to travel back and forth a lot to the state. And he knows about the business that we're doing, trying to reimagine the flight experience. And he was telling me, man, you know what, forget this thing. Just come up with a drug. And this drug, as long as it has minimal brain damage, I will take it. Knocks me down for 12 hours or so, and I arrive at the destination. That's only what I'm asking for. I said, wow, what did they do to you? I said, well, every other week you have to fly for 12 hours? That's not a really good experience. I'm starting to hate myself. I said, okay, let me show you something else. This is an alternate reality. Imagine it's the year 2016, and you're going to have another one of these intercontinental flights, but air travel has never been more enjoyable. You walk into the lobby of the aircraft, it's more like a flying hotel. Rows and rows of luxurious suites, and you open the door, there's a dedicated living room. Moroccan mint tea, freshly brewed, on the table, precisely at the right temperature, not too hot, not too cold. Trené, the room next door, there's a comfy bed with Egyptian cotton bed sheet. And if you're not in the mood to sleep just yet, maybe you want to take a shower first. This is happening at an altitude of 35,000 feet. That's impressive. So your journey starts from the moment that you board the aircraft. You don't have to confine yourself in a claustrophobic cage. Your shoulders doesn't have to bump into the passenger next to you. Your knees will not get crushed by the front passenger reclining the seat. It's also perfect, so who would mind to fly a few hours extra? Well, this sounds too good to be true. Well, this is actually very real. This is something that is being launched this year. But my only concern is that probably most of us in this room are never going to have that experience. Because for the same price that you have to pay for a single flight, you can actually rent a three-bedroom nice apartment in New York for a whole year. <laughs> well, I mean, some rich dudes in the crowd might say that I'll pay that. Well, that's not necessarily a good investment for that amount of money. If you fly often, you should probably get your own private jet. That's a lot more luxurious, customize the interiors. So we're talking about the future. That's the future for the rich people. So next time, as you're boarding the aircraft, the flight attendant will ask for your ticket. Can I see your ticket, please, sir? So the ticket, and it's OK, back of the aircraft. That's where the rest of us belong, for the 99%. OK, the back of the aircraft, speaking of that, how does it look like in the future? <laughs> it's quite different. Not sure if different is the right word to describe that. Maybe it's different in the sense that you're going straight from a wonderful dream into a hellish nightmare. So, that's an actual product. This is not a concept. This was showcased a few years back in a major exhibition. And this is where we are headed. And I don't think anybody of us would like to be in one of those seats. So when you talk to the airline industry, they say, you know what? You're just being stingy. You want a better experience? Just pay more. Upgrade to business class. Say, OK, you're just missing something here. It's not that I pay another 100 bucks and, up, and I'm upgrading to business class. There's a huge gap between the two. It's like you're asking me, we have two cars, you have two choice. There's the 1960 Ford Galaxy, there's the 2014 Lamborghini. Choose one of them, you should be able to afford one. That's against the principle of a free market. In the free market, you want to offer something for any purchasing power. And that's how you maximize your profit, and people will benefit. So I'm not sure what the airline industry is trying to do, what sort of business model they have in their head, but whatever it is, it's definitely not working. In fact, from 2001 to 2009, for nine consecutive years, US airlines, they lost cumulatively $58 billion. 
So next time you see the CEOs of airlines, Richard Branson, Tony Fernandez and all, you say, okay, these are the rich dudes. Definitely they are rich. But in fact, the airline industry, it's one of the poorest industry, if not the poorest. So the airlines, they have a net profit margin of 0.1% out of $143.3 billion of revenue. The revenue is huge. The profit is small. In fact, it's so small that you cannot even see it in the graph. It's right there. <laughs> Ouch. So to put that into perspective, Apple, they're making a net profit margin of 25.35%. That's a huge difference between the two industries. But there's also another major difference. You're talking about the telecom industry, you're talking about electronics. There's major change happening every other year. They have a reason to ask for more money. That's not happening in the airline industry. So when you talk to the airline CEOs, we have been doing that for the past one year. They say that, okay, when we say 0.1% out of $143.3 billion of revenue, that's only 21 cents per passenger. That's the amount of money that, ma that they make when you fly. And when they add those horrendous seats, it's just, what, a couple of few other rows of seats, and they're making $10 more per flight. You're talking about $21 per passenger. So that's where we're headed. They're going to degrade people like that, put them like frozen chicken into packed spaces for another $10. So that's how desperate the airline industry is. They said that, you know what, this is not our fault. 35% of our operational cost comes from the fuel and oil prices is just going up and down all the time. So we have to keep the prices at a competitive level, but in the end we cannot survive because the competition is so intense. But then again, the question just pops out of your head. Isn't it the same thing with every other industry? Every single thing that we know of, somehow, directly or indirectly, it's related to the price of oil. Which brings me to this question. Why do you choose coffee shop X over coffee shop Z? Why do you pay more for coffee X and less for coffee Z? It's the same ingredient, it's coffee, it's sugar, but you pay more or less for the environment, for the experience, and that's what the airline industry has been lacking for the past 60 years. So, in fact, these are nine supposedly different airlines. You walk into the cabin, you see the same set of seats, you see the same environment. So the question is, if I cannot recognize your experience, if I cannot associate with it, for what reason should I choose you over someone else? It's the same thing as saying, hey, we don't care about you, and you don't care about us. So there's no love and hate relationship in the same way that we have with other service providers. So, and in fact, the interesting thing about the airline industry is the, the experience has been so standardized for 60 years that so nobody realized that these seats, even though they look identical, they actually come from different manufacturers. Now, there was recently in the court, Apple was suing Samsung, hey, you have this tablet, it's rectangular and it has rounded corners, that's mine. So these are different manufacturers, I copy your seat, cool? Go for it. <laughs> That's how the industry works. So they are one happy family, one big happy family. There's no competition. And for us as consumer, that means a lack of option. They say, okay, this is what you get. Take it or leave it. And in the long run, it's damaging both of us. That's the money that they're making. They're all going bankrupt. And now we know why they hate us. And we, of course, know why we hate them back. So. This is very straightforward. You want to create a memorable experience, a unique identity and brand, so somehow you can stand out of the competition. But this is so straightforward that people say, okay, are you the only genius in the room? Nobody's seeing that? Well, it, this is part of a bigger fact that the airline industry is hiding from you and somehow from themselves. They are just denying it. So a small fact, so subtle fact. So 
what we do, of course, we design seeds. We are looking into reimagining the technology of travel. And that's our job. We look at those subtle and little things. That's where the innovation is. That's where the money lies, actually. So have you ever noticed that in a typical economy class, why the armrest is too low? So in fact, it's too low that you have to slide down a little bit. And as you do that, you lose that extra few inches of leg room that you have, and that's why your knees get crushed by the front seat, so that your body is minimally supported by the backrest, and pretty much there's no headrest and neckrest. So that's an average human, 170 centimeter, or five foot seven inches. Right now, when they design the seats, they refer to this 50-year-old book. There are numbers from the table. They pick it, and they put it, and say, okay, the backrest should be this tall, the armrest should be this high. But we have a state-of-the-art uh, state technology, and I'm sure the innovators in the industry, what they have been doing for the past few decades, we have the 3D scanning technology, and that's what we did. We bring actual humans, we scan them, and we put them into the computer, and say, okay, that's the normal economy seats, and that's what happens. Now, you know why your body is sore after a long-haul flight, because that's not a natural posture. You have to bring your shoulders lower than the natural height. You have to put your back, lower back, under so much pressure. That's the concept of jet lag. Well, an industry which hasn't changed for the past 60 years. We've been told a lot by the people that we talk to. And they say, okay, this is going to be a huge challenge. You're talking about a supply chain, which is a mess. But what we tell them is that, okay, just look at a few pictures, 1959, 2014 today, it's getting worse. <laughs> but people are getting larger. That's the thing. Seats are getting smaller, people are getting larger. It's going to be a very bad experience. Now, that was an average human. I'm not a giant exactly, but I'm pretty tall. I imagine that how would I look like in one of those seats? It's a terrible experience. You don't want to be <laughs> like me. So 50 years is a very long time. 50 years is so long that our body has started to change. And 50 years is a long time when you look at other industries and what they have been doing. 1960s, our cars, and today they cannot be even compared. Now we have the state-of-the-art electronics and safety features. The entertainment industry, we used to have this black and white, 14 inches in wide, in width, uh, TVs. Not many even have them. And today we are talking about bendable 3D 100 plus wireless LEDs for a more immersive experience. In the telecommunication industry, we had the typical landline. Not many had them back then. But now we can talk on the go. We can interact with our phones using our voice, facial expression, fingerprint. Our phone is our camera. It's our music player. It's our video game device. It's anything that we could have imagined to be. Well, these all technologies, one generation before me, the designers and engineers, they were inspired by Star Trek. For example, iPad was inspired by PATH from Star Trek, which was the personal access display device, or cell phone. It was inspired by the original series of Star Trek communicator. Now, as, new, as the new generation of designer and innovator, we have an advantage. We just don't watch a, a movie, we actually play video games, and we play a role in that. So when people tell me that, okay, this is a great challenge, and I'm not sure if we can do this, I tell them this. And say, as a gamer, you have to be persistent, you have to be determined to beat that final boss. And that's what we are trying to do. What we have done as teenagers, we used to play these games and save the planet Earth single-handedly. That's, of course, in a video game, but that's the spirit that we have, that's the mentality that we have. So by this point in time, I'm imagining that you're very curious to know what is this going to be all about. Well, I have to come back to you in two years and tell you how we are going to revolutionize the industry. But what we are trying to do 
I cannot guarantee, let's have that quick flashback to that 2016 example. I cannot guarantee that you will be flying in a three-room hotel. That's not a feasible experience. But what I can guarantee is that you will have a choice and a choice to fly a better flight. Thank you very much.